Spotlight On is brought to you by Light, the technology platform reimagining e-commerce for live events. You can learn more about Light at light.com forward slash partnerships. That is L-Y-T-E dot com forward slash partnerships. 30 seconds to respond. 30 seconds to respond with our anti-ballistic missile. Hello and welcome to the final episode of Season 6 of Spotlight On. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. This week, the spotlight shines on music marketer Fiona Bloom and the lifetime of work she's done breaking countless artists in the world of hip-hop, indie rock, and more. From her beginnings as on-air radio talent and party promoter in Atlanta to grinding it out in the independent music world of New York City, Fiona's career reflects the results of lots of hustle and lots of flow. I hope you enjoy our talk. Thanks for making time. It's nice to meet you. Yes, likewise. So you're in Seattle. I am. I'm just yes, yeah. just south. Yeah, and it is beautiful. It's sunny. It's completely anomalous right now. And so it's about 60 degrees. Yeah, yeah. So that's warmer than it is in New York. New York, we're about 52, and it's a little cloudy. The sun is trying so hard to come out, but it's being uh, taken over by these deep gray clouds. <laughs> so yeah, a little yeah. bit dark and gloomy in this area, but that's okay. I love it. While we're on the subject of weather, let me uh, let me ask you, because I can't place it, where are you from? What's your accent? Uh, right. That mystery, yes. The enigma. I am from London. Not Ontario, London. Not Canada. But <laughs> England, London. I have lived in America for about 25 years. Before New York, I was in Atlanta. So, of course, you can hear the southern twinge. And, and then various parts of the world for a short amounts of time, like Israel for a little bit and Italy for a few months. But no, but this is, this is just my watered down version of an English accent who's been here too long. So. It reminds me of the, uh, the Greenwich accent from the old films. <laughs> ah, right. Okay. Well, I mean, when I go back to my hometown and I'm back in England, then I've got that real, it's sort of my dad comes from a Cockney. He's got the Cockney rhyming slang. So he's like, hello, mate, is a what? Yeah, in it, in it, you know. And my mum's very posh. So I had the best of both worlds. So when I come back to England, it's sort of you hear a bit of both. A bit of both. <laughs> both, <laughs> both with the F, both, not B-O-T-H, but both, B-O-F. <laughs> How Atlanta? How did you end up in Atlanta? Yeah, that was my dad's fault. He basically took a job out in Atlanta. He wanted to emigrate. They wanted to take the whole family to, I have younger brothers and sisters. They wanted to take the whole family to America, but the dream was either LA or New York. And it was just far too expensive at the time to be in either of those cities to have a play, a big own a house or property. It was just, it wasn't going to happen. So my dad took the job in Atlanta and said, well, this will be temporary. And meanwhile, it's been all these years later and he's still there. So that's why we came to Atlanta, yeah. Was it Coca-Cola? What was he affiliated with? No, it was landscaping. It was landscaping and architecture type stuff, landscaping, construction type stuff, and then it ended up being publishing. But definitely not Coca-Cola. He ended up working with the mayor of Atlanta, though, with a beautiful book that was sort of helping tourism in Atlanta, sort of the book of Atlanta. It was like a picture book of all the buildings, architecture, like all the landscape of Atlanta, which my dad helped put together. So, yeah. And so what was the Atlanta of that time? What did you walk into? Oh my God. It was very redneck. I hate to even use that word. It was just, it was not cosmopolitan at all. It's not like it is today. It was just very Southern and slow and that was fine, but it just took a lot to adjust because seeing me with a very thick accent and, you know, standing out from the rest, just looking like the target the minute I walk in the room, I was definitely bullied a lot. Yeah, it was, it was tough. It was tough coming in at the time. The English accent wasn't really something cool that it would be now. It was more like to make fun of. People made fun of me because I just, I looked different, seemed different, acted different, sounded different, all of that stuff. So not the best experiences coming up, growing up in my late teens, early twenties, but 
as I keep going back, I mean, it's an incredible place to be now. I mean, it's vibrant, it's international, it's cosmopolitan, it's the, you know, incredible music coming out of there, culture, the scene, especially urban. I mean, I was doing hip hop for a long time. Um, the hip hop scene in Atlanta is huge. As you know, it's like the biggest in the world. So some of the biggest rappers all over the world flocked to Atlanta, have come out of Atlanta, created businesses there and hugely flourished, taken off doing incredible things. What did you bring with you from London or England to Atlanta? In other words, were you already into music? Did you, did you stand out fashion wise? Like what, who, you know, who were you when you got there? Yeah, I, did, I probably did stand out fashion wise because I was wearing pink trousers with green boots, funky pink hair. So I definitely stood out. I brought a bit of punk rock with me to Atlanta. So the, definitely the fashion sensibility, but that didn't come on too well. <laughs> I don't think it was really, that was more being made fun of was my fashion sense. And then the music side, yeah, I was a musician. So I was playing the piano and violin. So coming into school, holding the violin, wearing these funky outfits didn't go over too well. But what did I take out? What did I bring? What did I bring from, aside from being the musical and the fashion sense and punk rock sense? Yeah, I brought a lot to the table, actually, because I ended up getting a really cool radio show in college radio with my punk rock knowledge, my jazz knowledge, putting everything all together, I ended up getting a great gig on college radio with my own radio show. I guested on the best of Britain. I did my own all that jazz show on college radio. And that basically became the launch pad into a successful career in radio because I ended up, ended up getting recruited to commercial radio, you know, and I, and also my, my dry sense of humor. People love my jokes initially they didn't quite understand where I was coming from but then I was always like the clown in the room but always the one that made everybody laugh and so I'd like to think I brought a lot of my humor to Atlanta. So there's some parallel paths going on you there's your musical life as a musician yes. there's your musical life as a fan a, a young adult who is immersed in music and then there's this person who is starting to make their way on sort of the business creative side. Yes, coming from the radio side, coming in. Yeah, yep. Was music, was it Was it from an early age, you're going to be in music one way or the other on that spectrum? Or like, did, did at what point did you say, I'm not going to be the artist, I'm going to be the person that's putting the artist out there? You know, the minute I came out the womb, basically, I had to be in music. At the age of three, four years old, I was already having piano lessons. I took violin lessons at six, seven. And that all started really taking off. But the epiphany, sort of the aha moment when I realized that I wasn't going to really make it as a recording artist or a concert pianist or a famous artist on stage and in front of the camera, the day I realized I was going to be behind the camera was really when my radio career started taking off, when I knew that I just had this affinity for being a voice, not being seen necessarily, but just being the voice, being the recognizable voice and then also helping artists on the other side, like helping discover artists and helping them become famous, giving them the spotlight, shining the mic and the cameras on them, not me. But that this was really where I was going to go. And I was going to end up doing, you know, music industry business somewhere, somehow. Because even in radio, I didn't think of it as business. I still thought of it as being a radio personality and still the talent, because you really are the on-air talent. But then when I realized radio was short-lived, then it occurred to me, okay, I'm really meant to be behind the scenes, at least for now, discovering music, putting artists on, promoting them in every shape, way, fashion that I can. Yeah, yeah. So I discovered all that in Atlanta, yes. Not to belabor it, but what was the nature of the revelation that you weren't going to be the performing artist? I feel like a lot of people in our business have that moment because they grow up playing. And I'm curious to what your version of that is. I was practicing hours and hours and hours a day, and it still wasn't good enough. I mean, especially in classical, you have to be great. It's not rock and roll where you could let things slide. You could be a little dusty, be a little dirty, be a little raw. You can't be raw. There's no forgiveness in being a classical pianist, in, in having any mistakes, any kind of raw. It has to be polished. Everything has to be clean, crystalline polished amazingly 100% or 110%. And I, I would practice seven, eight hours a day and I'd still never reach greatness. I'd still be 
good, but not the best or better than you were yesterday, but still not good enough. And not winning competitions, coming in third, coming in fourth. That's not good enough. You cannot in that business come in third, fourth, fifth. You've got to come in second or really first. And I just knew, okay, I'm not that winner. I'm not going to win these competitions. And it was sad because it was one of those sort of raison d'etre moments where I thought, okay, this is just not meant to be. Like my life is going in another plane, in another place, just doing it differently. But I knew, I knew even then that it had to be something in music, that my life could never leave music. It was always going to have to be that that shaped me, that's going to continue shaping me. It's going to be me doing this till I die. It had to be music. There's some specific attributes or projects or, or moments in your career I want to talk about. And of course, I want to talk about what you do now. But I'd love it if you could take us through the transition period. You know, you said even when you were on air, there's an element of you're the talent. How did you end up fully on the business side? I didn't even want to be in the business side. I didn't even have a thought, a second thought that that's what I wanted to do business. I, I love radio. I love being sort of the personality, even if it was not me on camera. I just enjoyed being the personality. I enjoyed coming out and giving speeches. I like to go doing emceeing shows, being the, the master of ceremonies. I just, you know, enjoyed that of being the party hat, being the promoter. So it wasn't really until I lost my gig really on radio, the commercial gig. I ended up getting fired. Crazy story. Don't even know how to go into all the details. But I got fired on commercial radio. And basically my boss at the time said, you'll never find another gig on commercial radio. It's like I'd been blackballed because once you get fired, it just word gets around that you can't work with her. She's not employable. She's not this. She's not that. So it was very difficult to find another commercial radio gig. Definitely not in that market. And it's not like I wanted to move to Birmingham or Tuscaloosa or Charlottesville or anywhere. I mean, it was hard enough being a British voice. This is the early 90s. Hard enough being a British voice being accepted in Georgia and Atlanta, let alone going elsewhere down south, further south. And I knew that East Coast was going to be tough because it's just too much competition. Philly, New York, D.C., it's impossible. You know, I had to go to a smaller market. So that wasn't going to happen. So I realized to stay somehow with my voice out there and having my own show, I'd have to go to community radio, which I did and I loved. But community radio didn't pay the bills. There was, I think I was, I had to do it for free. It was was all a volunteer effort. So volunteering at community radio, keeping my name out there, I started building even a bigger platform for me to do things with. So I started getting into party promoting, collecting money on the side. And from the party promoting, then realized, oh, I'm really good at this. And I'm really good at promotion. I'm really good at doing local PR. Then it became regional PR. And next thing you know, I was starting to make money looking after local bands, looking after regional bands. And just one thing led to the next. And I realized, oh, okay, I'm going to call this Fiona Bloom Promotions. And then I teamed up with another promotions person and we had a company called Roche and Bloom. She did Michelle Roche. She did PR and I called radio stations all day. Sounded like a law firm, law firm Roche and Bloom, <laughs> but we quickly became that very successful uh, marketing agency, if you will, in Atlanta. And the only reason we stopped doing it was because she ended up getting a national job moving to LA doing PR. And I ended up getting a national job in New York doing marketing. And that's when I moved to New York. She moved to LA and we folded Roche and Bloom. But it was from then on, from those days in Atlanta, realizing that I was good at promoting parties, good at getting the word out, good at PR, artist relations. I realized I had a knack for that and a gift of gab and just sort of took that and went with it. What were the kind of artists you were working with in the, in the say, early mid-90s? Were you coming up at the same time as Atlanta hip hop was emerging? Definitely not. On the cusp, because La Face Records had just started with Babyface and L.A. Reid, so then he had just signed TLC, Damian Dame, Tony Braxton, Outcast. Right before I moved to New York, yes. But Atlanta hip hop certainly was not on the map then. Absolutely not. It was very strip club rap. Like that was the type of rap that was emanating in Atlanta, just the strip club type stuff. 
before doing the, the hip hop radio station stuff on community radio, when I had Roshan Bloom, I was doing rock and roll. So at the time it was Michelle Malone, who's still going strong. You know, the Indigo Girls, Follow for Now, Driving and Crying, Five Eight. A lot of the bands from Athens, because the Athens scene was huge. We were doing a few of those bands from Athens. And then, yeah, the rock scene was starting to really thrive. Black Crows, at that point, were called Mr. Crow's Garden. I had seen one of the Black Crows' first shows when they were kind of crap, to be honest. Nobody in their wildest dreams knew that they would ever take off because they weren't very good. (laughs) And then they (laughs) changed the name and boom, it just exploded. But we were working with those types of bands. We had a band from Tuscaloosa called Storm Orphans. We had a band from Seattle, I think, called Young Fresh Fellows. So a lot of different bands were hearing about our work, coming to us, managers, the bands themselves. Because at the time, a lot of these bands were unsigned. A couple were signed, but most of them we were dealing with were unsigned because we were just getting started. Nobody from the major labels were really going to hire us. Nobody from Badador or Sub Pop or any of those XL Beggars Banquet, they weren't going to hire us. We were just starting to come into our own. We were just starting to get our own reputation. And again, it was very local at the time. Everyone at Atlanta knew who we were. Some people at the Southeast, but nobody in New York at that time, nobody really in LA knew who Michelle Roche or Fiona Bloom was. Definitely I was becoming a celebrity in, in the local market because I had the radio background because at that point now I was doing a hip hop show called World Party or WRFG. So I was very well known. The mayor knew who I was. I was getting written up in the Atlanta Journal Constitution, Peach Buzz, other radio stations would interview me. Yeah. So I was doing very well. Just to help sort of complete the sort of historical picture for listeners. What was the model back then? Meaning if you're working with unsigned artists or early developing artists, and their managers or people affiliated with them are reaching out to you. Was there a national sort of footprint of regional marketing and promotion people that were activated? Like, how did, like, why did they need, were you, were you just looking after the Southeast for someone or like, what was, what was the thing you were doing? We, we would, we just fell into it. We were doing regional and national because I would be calling radio stations, mainly college radio stations all across the country. So, you know, whether it was in New Orleans or, or San Francisco or Seattle, all the college radio stations across the country, we would just get lists. Back then they had a CMJ music chart, college music journal, weekly magazine, which I would subscribe to. And you would just see all the different charts, all the different radio stations. They published their program director's information, the call times, Monday to Wednesday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., Thursdays, 12 to 4. You know, they would list the, the, the phone numbers. We didn't have email back then. Remember, this is pre-internet, pre-social media. So I couldn't stalk them on Twitter. I couldn't find them anywhere but their phone numbers. And the only way to find their phone numbers and to get the, you know, radio station info was these call sheets and these charts, these magazines. So subscribing to CMJ really, really helped. I would often go to Barnes and Nobles and sit for hours. Eventually I'd buy a few magazines, but I'd sit for hours just looking at the mastheads and we didn't have mobile phones. So I couldn't even take screenshots of the mastheads. So I would literally be writing down the pages of publisher, associate editor, executive editor, editor in chief with their names and their phone numbers and their addresses. And I would just try to phone them, get the receptionist or get the actual phone numbers or write to them. That was the only way to do it back then. You're tracking these people down to basically tell your artist's story. Here's why this artist is right for your outlet. Here's what the story behind them is. And- tracking them down, sending them CDs or vinyl. Not as much vinyl because that was costly, but we did ship vinyl and it was pricey. But yeah, sending CDs, sending vinyl, calling them on the phone. Hey, did you get the CD package that I sent the other day of 5-8? 5-8 is going to be doing a regional tour. Love you to check out the album. Here are the three focus tracks. Love if you could give some spins. It'd be great if you could add it to rotation. That was my, my hat for radio and then flipping it and doing publicity as well. Hey, I'd love a review. I mean, my partner did that, but I also did that too. Hey, we'd love a review of the album or if you could come to the show, do a live review and just making the pitch. 
Why would they be great to do a live review? Their frenetic energy on stage is crazy. They do these wild things on stage that you've never seen before. It's one of the best live bands of rock and roll right now. Trust me, they're going to be breaking out big. You don't want to miss the opportunity. Just the pitch, the spiel, if you will, right? Yeah. So, and that was it. That was what we had to do. There was no real blueprint or footprint for how this was done. But there were a few national publicists and radio pluggers that I admired that would never take my phone calls, but I looked at them from afar and saw how they were doing things, would meet them, see them at conferences, because I would go to CNJ's conference, go to South by Southwest. There was a couple of Midwest or Southeastern conferences, and everybody would sort of all convene, and you would try to meet them and get two minutes of their time to get an ear in to kind of see how they do it, how they got to where they are. But I didn't have mentors back then. It wasn't like it is today. There was no music business program to study. There were no real workshops that I could take. I kind of learned as I went. Was it fun? Oh, I had a blast. It was so much work and so much effort, but I loved every minute of it. Yes, it was fun. It was fun to be at the shows. It was fun to go on the road with them. It was fun to be backstage. It was fun to go to the conferences. It was fun to make mistakes and trial and error, doing things differently and doing a different approach. Or, you know, even if you embarrassed yourself getting an editor on the phone or a PD that you've never spoken to before and you stuttered because you were so nervous. It was all fun. Absolutely. Great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about New York. So you're in Atlanta. You've built this thing, sort of big fish in a medium-sized pond, and uh, New York comes calling. Yeah, New York came calling. It was like a dream. I mean, I never in a million years expected to come to New York to work for a record label because I never even wanted to work at a record label. The idea was never planted in my head. So it was kind of a fluke. But the guy that gave me the job was Daniel Gloss, who was the president of EMI Chrysalis at the time, who now has his own successful label, Gloss Note Records. He came to Atlanta a lot because he had signed Arrested Development he signed Bolo for Now, he signed Dallas Austin, he signed Joy. He signed a bunch of rock and hip-hop at the time as hip-hop was just starting to explode, just on the precipice, you know, really at the beginning stages. So Daniel would just come down to the clubs, he'd come down to meetings. And because I was well-known and had my popular radio show, because all the hip-hop people knew me and because all the rock and roll people knew me, he would just see me running around in the club and just kind of observed and watched me from afar and finally came up to me and basically was like, we could really use you in New York. Love how, you, how you're fresh, your ears are open, and you're, you have a whole fresh approach to things. You're raw. You haven't had a whole lot of industry experience, but I like that. Like, how would you like to come work for us, basically, is how it happened. But it wasn't as easy as that, because once he went back to New York, it took me weeks before I even got a hold of his secretary. It wasn't until six, eight weeks later that his secretary said, yeah, Come up to New York. Let's have an interview. Neither that interview process was even a done deal. I had to pay my way to New York. I had a 10 hour interview. And when I came back to Atlanta, I had no idea whether I got the job or not. Even if Daniel had said to me months before, yeah, we'd love to have you here. Love to have you do this new position we'll create for you. That's sort of a street marketing, national micro marketing job, a brand new department. We'd love to have you spearhead it. It wasn't that simple. It took me months before I even got in their ears and eyes, came to New York, came back to Atlanta, had no idea I'd even get offered the job. Finally, two months later, they offered me the job. So that whole process took about six months. Wow. It was just me being totally diligent, persistent, relentless, desperately saying, this job is for me. It's got my name all over it. I want this really badly. And finally, six months later, came to New York. So they did a huge goodbye party for me in Atlanta. Everybody was there. The mayor, Outcast performed. Little John was the DJ. Pebbles was there. Like every who's who in the Atlanta urban scene and rock were all there to send me off. Dallas Austin, Goody Mob, like they were all there. Little John, Ying Yang Twins, all of them. They were all there. That's amazing. And they performed. Escape performed. Yeah, Outcast and Escape performed and a bunch of other artists too. Right as Outcast was about to blow up. So that was great. Yeah. So you get to New York because I love to know just because that's the New York of my era as well. Where, where did you move? Where did you first live? Yeah. Well, luckily my college, you know, I went to several colleges. So Georgia State was where I got my broadcast journalism communications degree. But prior to that, I was in music 
and theatre at University of Maryland and uh, Philadelphia College of Performing Arts. So at University of Maryland, I became very friendly with a girl there from England that lived in New York, and I had told her I was moving to New York, got this job, and she said, oh, she goes, I'm giving up my apartment on the Upper West Side, 79th and West End Avenue, to go live with my boyfriend. I don't want to give up the apartment altogether, so I'd love you to sublet it. Classic. Classic New York. Classic. Classic New York. So I come up straight away with an apartment. You know, it was fully furnished. I didn't have to really bring in anything. So I put my stuff in storage, came up to New York and lived there for about eight months in beautiful area. Can't get any better than the Upper West Side. And so close to 25 blocks away from EMI Chrysalis, which was on uh, 51st and 6th Avenue. So 79th and West End, very short commute. You were so posh right from the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> it's so posh. Well, it, did, it didn't, it didn't end posh, Lawrence. It got, it got really seedy. The, the, the rest of my life, not now, but as I left West Side, it got really seedy. And I, I can definitely tell you all about that. But EMI Chrysalis was a tough place to be. Nobody really helped me out there. I sort of went in the deep end with a bunch of sharks. Everybody really, I felt, was um, not happy to see me there. I felt like there was a lot of jealousy. Like, how did, who is this woman? Like, who, girl, like, who is this young woman that's got this plush job, great office with a 35th floor with windows all around? Who is this woman that's taken this position, this newly crafted position with like a background of nothing in the record industry that comes from radio? party promoting and a little bit of regional PR under her belt. So nobody was really there to help sort of hold my hand or show me the ropes. And Daniel Gloss certainly wasn't available for me. It was very tough. I had a tough time. People made it tough for me. We had 9 a.m. meetings in this big conference room, which I was so intimidated. I'd ride the train, sometimes get there at like 9.04 and come in and everybody's already settled in. And looking at me like, you're late. Thinking to myself, this is the record industry. Like, I thought there was some license here to be three, four minutes late. And a 9 a.m. meeting when you're expected to go out late at night seeing shows or this is entertainment biz. It didn't make sense to me. And it was very hard to go from having flexibility in Atlanta, being a party chick, being out all hours of the night, but still getting work done, but having a very loose schedule to now something that's very, very tight-knit, hardcore, very black and white, no gray area, and now realizing that you're going to be penalized for being four minutes late. And a conference room full of like 60 people. We're not talking five, 10 people. We're talking 60 people. Department heads, all the departments, with all the department heads, and the president. And, And every now and again, Charles Koppelman would show his face as well. So talk about humiliating, talk about intimidating, talk about nerve wracking, freak out. Like I would just be so nervous on that train, looking at my watch going, I'm bloody late. I'm bloody late. Having heart palpitations. Very stressful. Very stressful. Not rock and roll. No, not rock and roll at all. No. And men in suits. Like the people at the company weren't in tats. They weren't pissed. They were all in Suits and ties, not a place I was comfortable in. So that was a short-lived job, lasted about 11 and a half months. They basically dissolved my position, fired. I I hate to use the word fired, but, you know, they dissolved my position. And it was for the best because I felt like I was shrinking violet. I felt like I couldn't get creative. I couldn't really lend my talents in any of the marketing campaigns I mean, I did a few cool things there. Don't get me wrong. I did well with the Gangstars Hard to Earn record. I did the Soul Sonics. I was on tour with the Fuji's first national tour because it was Queen Latifah, the Fuji's and Soul Sonics. And I looked on to the Soul Sonics. I was on the road with them. So got to know the Fuji's a little bit. So that was all cool. That was all early 1994. But the rest of it, not so cool. But I did make some really good friends there. And, you know, I learned a few things there. I don't want to say I learned a lot. Because everything was pushed on me so quickly and I didn't have time to adjust to the learning curve. So I can't say I learned that much because I came out of there, everything was a blur and realized I kind of had to start from scratch to get a new job. So it wasn't easy. So what did that look like? What did you do? 
I was temping for a little bit, freaking out, because a lot of people thought, are you moving back to Atlanta where you're a celebrity? I'm like, are you kidding me? I, after that big send-off, that huge goodbye party less than a year ago, there's no way I could move back there. I'd feel like a freaking failure. Yeah, it's a one-way ticket. It, yeah, it was a one-way ticket. So I was determined to, to work it out. I was determined to make it in New York, figure it out, work for another record company because I knew I couldn't do radio. Why well, I, I don't say I don't want to say I knew I couldn't. I just basically knocked it off as if I that wasn't that wasn't an option. I never gave it another thought, radio, which I regret today because I could have had a nice career in radio, potentially, maybe not. But yeah, so I ended up doing some temp work here and there for about two months, which is really nothing. And luckily, the uh booking talent buyer at Brownies, which is a very successful huh. local. I lived club. right down the street from Brownies. I lived on East 11th Street at uh, first and second. <laughs> God, I spent so many nights at Brownies. So Mike Studo, who's still around, obviously not Brownies or Hi-Fi, but he sold his, he sold that club and he sold his other club. I'm not sure what he's doing these days, but he, he told me that there's a, a new record company fully funded because the guy comes from Wall Street money and it's an indie rock label. And he's looking for a publicist and I'm putting your name in there, Fiona. Just, it's up to you to get the interview and up to you to get the job. So I was like, I, I'll do it. I love it. I want to do this job. You know, even though indie rock really at the time wasn't my passion because the EMI chrysalis and coming from hip hop, knowing that I've done rock early on and I love rock and roll, but I sort of became the hip hop chick and I sort of became the urban the rap and hip hop and just loving the hip hop culture, loving R and B, loving soul. So when I heard the word indie rock, it wasn't really my passion at the time, but I thought I've got to, I've got to get this gig. I, I don't want to do temp work. I don't want to work for FedEx if I have to, or don't want to be at a, a retail at Macy's. Like I've got to get this job. So I did. I talked my way into it because basically Ray McKenzie, who owned Zero Hour at the time from prior Wall Street, he had said, have you done PR before? And I dabbled in it from Atlanta regional, but I'd never really done it full on. So I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I've done PR. Absolutely. I've gotten press in here and I can do that. And I write press releases and I can put spins on stuff. And I guarantee you, I'll get you in Rolling Stone and Entertainment Weekly and Polestar and Newsweek and all these other places for spin, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I can do it. No problem. So we thought about it and he said, uh, all right, the job's yours. And the rest was history because I ended up putting zero hour on the map in a huge way. They did get in People magazine. I did get them in Rolling Stone. I did get them in Entertainment Weekly and Newsweek and New York Times and Spin and Alternative Press. Everything you can imagine, I got them in. Zero Hour was like the, one of the most talked about indie rock labels literally overnight. And it got to the point where every major label executive wanted to hire me. They wanted to bring me on to do PR for their record labels. But Ray lied to them and told them that I was under contract. <laughs> I had no contract with this guy. There was no contract. I was just getting a yearly salary and that was it. So how did you go from being regional, almost PR person to getting those things done? Was it just sheer force of will and hustle? Force of will and a database because I had no database for national stuff at all. I had a Rolodex. Right. Because again, this is the end of 1994 because EMI Chrysalis was, you know, January 1994. I lost the gig in November. So I think I literally started 1995 or I felt like I started zero hour end of it was either December 1994, or early January 1995. And again, there was really, I can't even remember if we were doing email. We were doing email, but it was sort of like AOL and MindSpring and very early days of online internet, anything, right? Very early days. It was happening, but not everyone knew. So we're still very much mailing things out and phone calls and everything else. So I knew I was determined to just get on the phone, get people on the phone. And once I got them on the phone, just get my stuff resonated and convince them just to cover my thesis. And I knew I had the will. It was the force of will, force of nature. And luckily, the database was already there because they did have a PR person that was sort of part-time, that was doing work for them or on a sort of a freelance basis called Nicole Blackman, who became a successful poet. 
um, spoken word artist, poet. She had that national database and allowed me to use it. And it was from then on that I would just update as I went, but I had something that I could use to grow on, to grow with. I got lucky with that. So, and yeah, I just broke down barriers. I got through walls and I just, through re- being relentless, being persistent, just really just got into the ears and eyes of every journalist, every writer, every editor, every TV produced talent booker on the planet. Yeah, just with a lot of hard work, but I managed. So behind you is some artwork for one of my favorite artists, MF Doom. How did you end up back in hip hop? So yeah, I bought MF Doom. Well, I can't take all the credit for signing MF Doom, but I put MF Doom on the map. I, we put out his records, Operation Doomsday and KMD's Black Bastards in 2000. So after Zero Hour, well, I shouldn't say after Zero Hour, but my passion always stayed in hip hop, even working through all the indie rock. And I started loving indie rock again. I had some great releases. I had The No Twist. I had The Dirt Merchants. I had Barnaline. I had Space Needle. I had Swerve Driver. A few other bands we were going after, like Tool. We didn't get Tool, unfortunately. But there was a few other bands we were courting. And I fell in love with rock and roll. I mean, I never left rock and roll. I love rock and roll. But I fell in love with the style and genre again. So when I put Zero Hour on the map, I got back in touch with Daniel Glass because he started a company with Doug Morris called Rising Tide. And they were looking to acquire small labels. They were looking to invest. So I called up Daniel. I said, Daniel, remember me? He's like, of course I don't remember you. I brought you to New York. And we've seen in touch a little bit. But I said, Daniel, you need to see what we're doing at Zero Hour. It's something quite brilliant. I definitely feel like with some funding, we can take it even further. We've got it. We're like an incubator. There's artists we're going after that we want to sign, that we don't have all the funds or the resources for. But if we do work with you and Doug Morris with Rising Tide, it would be endless, endless possibilities. So Daniel came in, met with my boss. They sat behind closed doors for hours and they ended up doing a multi-million dollar deal, which I instigated. So I really got nothing out of that because again, I wasn't the most business savvy. I didn't have contracts and my boss was like, you're the, you're amazing. What do you want? So he gave me a seven grand bonus, which is nothing considering the multi millions of dollars that they signed. And I said, well, you know what I'd love to do? I said, I'd love my own record label. I'd love a hip hop label. I'd love to start my own hip hop label. And I called it three, two, one, cause zero hour, three, two, one records, three, two, one and zero hour. He goes, Fiona, yes, whatever you want to do. Started three, two, one, just went after artists I wanted to sign, like atmosphere company flow, all these artists I was going after. Didn't get atmosphere at the time. I did bring them to New York. I was brought them to South by Southwest and we had a great relationship with that atmosphere and seven um, rhyme sayers, but never ended up doing anything with them because of my partner at the time. So I'm getting ahead of myself. So three, two, one records, I signed Black Alicia. So I first I put out a, a, a compilation called Connected, Went after a bunch of different artists, Cool Keith, and Ultra Magnetic MCs, Badawi, Angel, all kinds of really cool, cool, cool tracks and cool <laughs> I mean, artists. I have it, to interrupt you. Do you have any Cool Keith stories? <laughs> I do. I have a great Cool Keith story. Oh, God. Were you working with him when he played Tramps back? This would have been 97 I was there. I was there. I was at the Tramps show. I wasn't working with him per se. Yes. We tr- yes, because we tried to sign him. Yes. Oh God. Yes. We were all there. My boss. We were, yeah. Yeah. So, but backtracking a little bit about signing on three, two, one, the compilation did extremely well. We sold thousands of records for a compilation. We couldn't keep the vinyl in the stores. It was blowing off the racks of fat beats, amoeba records, all these different record stores, all the independent record stores. It was just blowing out of connected. Anyway, so I, because I put the new Black Alicious track on there, Black Alicious was so impressed with how I promoted Connected and how much buzz I got from that album. Tons of reviews everywhere, tons of promotion, marketing, branding, everything was in place for that record. They were so impressed that I ended up flying out to Oakland to offer them a recording contract and they signed and we put out two of their records, A to G with Cut Chemist. 
remix and Nia, the album. And that's how I got back into hip hop. So when Zero Hour ended up folding because they actually blew through a ton of money and Daniel Glass and Doug Morris at the time basically defunded us. They said, we're not going to put in any more money into Zero Hour. They basically pulled the plug. And when they pulled the plug on Zero Hour, they pulled the plug on 321. Even though we were the one making all the money, Zero Hour wasn't really making money. 321 was bringing in all the revenue. Because I had signed Scheme Team, Pumpkin Head with word of mouth. We had Black Alicious doing really well. We had the Connected album doing really well. I'm about to sign all these other artists. Things were going really, really well for 321. But on the other part of it, Zero Hour wasn't doing so well. So yeah, we were pulled the plug on, which was a crazy time in my life. I ended up getting really sick. I had to go to hospital because there was so much stress put on me with all the rappers that I'd signed and left them high and dry. Blackalicious were on tour at the time. We owed them money with their mastering, hadn't been paid. Studio fees hadn't been paid. It was supposed to get a bunch of tour support, hadn't been paid. They throwed me a bill with $75,000 that I owed them. Not me, because I wasn't the one funding them. It was my boss and a zero hour. So they put a lot of pressure on me. I ended up getting a tumor and being in hospital. So when I came out of the hospital, I started a brand new label called Subverse. And I started it with a partner that was big just from company Flow Mm -hmm. and another Wall Street guy called Peter Lupoff. And some of the first records that we put out and that we signed was MF Doom. MF Doom at the time was very obscure. He had been on Bobito's label, Fondulum, and Bobito didn't have any marketing money. He was broke. This was a record he put out in 1999 with no promotion. He'd sold maybe 200 Operation Doomsday. So we came to him and bought the masters from him because MF Doom said, yeah, I mean, he agreed that we could put out those records with Subverse as long as we paid Bobito for the masters. So we paid Bobito a bunch of money for the masters and uh, then paid MF Doom some money. And next thing you knew, we put out the records and I got loads and loads of press and put them on the map. I mean, I got in huge stories in Rolling Stone and High Times and Vibe Magazine and Double XL. And just, the rest was history after that because he became an underground legend. I mean, fast forward going today where he is after he passed away, he's like one of the biggest iconic MCs of our era. I'd always known he was going to be huge like that, but you never really know what you're creating to the culture, what you're contributing to culture when you're putting out these records. You you don't know what you're going to end up with. So yeah, I mean, that was a record that I put out and I'm very, very proud of. And then the KMD album too. You know, I remember Dante, Dante, I can't forget Dante's last name. He was trying to put out the record and it got shelved through Warner. And we, because we had the rights to that as well, yeah, we put out KMD too. And again, we sold loads and loads of records. So Subverse became a really, really cool well-respected independent label. We put out a lot of records after that as well. But then after 9-11, I had to to basically sever ties. Sorry, this is, sorry. I had to, yeah. I, oh, I had to sever ties with um, Subverse because 9-11 happened. We would write, our office was right down on Wall Street, right by the Twin Towers. We were five blocks away on Greenwich Street. So, just my heart wasn't the same after that. I couldn't come into the office. It was closed for like months. Big Just had disappeared. He thought it was Nostradamus. So I had to sever ties from Subverse. And after that, I got a job a few months later as a talent buyer at Joe's Pub and then became international marketing director for TV Team Records. And that's where I came back with Little John, Ying Yang Twins, Pitbull, you know, we put his first records out with Pitbull. Basically, the introduction to Pitbull was through my work at TVT as well. So, but crazy stories with Cool Keith, crazy stories with P- Pitbull, Lil John. I've got loads of those stories, but that's like a whole nother interview. I mean, I feel yeah, like we'll have to do that. Yeah. We'll do a side one of those bonus content. What? So, what do you do today, and who do you do it for? I started a marketing branding agency about ten years ago called The Bloom Effect. And because I have so many talents or so many skills in this business from PR to marketing, to branding, to radio promotion, to video producing events, I decided, well, I'll apply all of that 
as a one-stop shop marketing branding agency today that's called The Bloom Effect. And I started this agency really after ending Subverse and going with Joe's Pub and going with TVT. I realized after TVT, I don't really need to work for anyone else. I can do all this successfully on my own, building a team and building a brand and building a company. I've built companies before. I built companies in Atlanta, you know, when I had the PO marketing firm with Michelle Roche, you know, I built Subverse, I built 321. Now I can build the Bloom Effect. I've always been a serial entrepreneur. I've always had that creative spark and that energy to do it my way, to be that sort of, yeah, I've been an entrepreneur since, really since before we even knew the word entrepreneur, before we even knew what that word meant, before it was floating in the universe, before it was cool to call yourself an entrepreneur. I was always that person, but never really knew how to describe myself. So yeah, so Bloom Effect basically came about just by virtue of taking back my own entity and starting what I built and being able to have creative control again and really loving what I do, what I do, just finding that passion, bringing that passion and that fire into the work that I'm doing, but having that work for myself so that I had something to own that I was my own boss, basically, and didn't have to really speak to anyone else and didn't really have to be accountable to anyone else but myself. And all these years later, it's been going great. You know, I, I, I do a plethora of services for these artists, you know, whether they're album campaigns, whether they're one-offs with doing event promotion, whether it's doing DSPs, working with getting playlist promotion, doing video promotion, doing tour marketing, international consulting, international PR, album publicity. It just really runs the gamut. But this time I have sort of a la carte services, sort of a suite of services that artists, managers, and labels can choose and hire me for those different opportunities or whatever they feel like they would like to have. You know, it's really just an individual campaign that I can customize and charge a retainer per month and do it that way. And it's been really, really effective. I mean, and the other thing about having my PR marketing agency is I get to work in all styles of music because generally when you work for a different company or you work for, you know, a company or an entity, it's generally they put you into, okay, you specialize in alternative marketing or you're in urban marketing or you're doing rock or you're doing jazz or you're doing reggae or hip hop. But now I get to work with hip hop and rock and country and Americana and jazz and pop. So I get to have my clients that are Tower of Power and the Zombies and Simple Minds and a band from Australia called Wanderers and a folk roots group artist called Bruce Adano and a pop artist called AJ Smith and a jazz group called Lowdown Brass Band, Stefan Rembell. You know, I have all types of music because for me, it's always been about two genres, good and bad. But just like Ellington said, you know, there's only two types of music and I work with the good. And that's kind of me, my same motto. I work with the good, all good music. If anything moves me, if I can groove to it, if I can feel it and really, really love it, I don't care what style of music it is. I can work it. The Bloom Effect, Bloom Effect can work it. Is that the litmus test for you in taking on a project? Do you have to connect with the music? 100% have to connect with it. I mean, if I don't love it, if I don't, if I don't want to listen to it when I'm done with work, if I can't put it on in the background when I'm cooking or when I want to go dancing or if I'm in my car or wherever I am, if I can't listen to it myself personally, I don't want to work with it. It's got to be something that I'm 100% sold on. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your journey. I really appreciate it. And I thank you for your work on Doom because that's a, that's a big part of my life. So I appreciate that. And, my, and now my 17-year-old son, he's a oh, massive well. Doom fan. So Yeah. The yeah. only regret I have in Doom is not holding on to one of his masks. Because if I had his metal face today, that could be worth millions of dollars. Well, or you could be out doing shows. <laughs> we'll run. Yeah. And also, well, yeah. And also, I I didn't take I didn't take a copy of the vinyl. We sold so much vinyl that I didn't have a copy for myself. I've got the CD, but I don't have a copy of the vinyl. I have a copy of K and D's vinyl, but not Operation Doomsday. And I just saw that on eBay recently and on Discogs 
for like $20,000. Not that I'd ever sell it, but I'd love to have something to hold on to. So, you know, a few regrets on some of the hip hop that I did create and some of the culture that I helped contribute to along the way. I don't, I didn't archive a lot of that stuff. Yeah. I think people forget though, 20, 25 years ago, hip hop was still really ephemeral. There was, it was I, this idea that every six or 12 months, the style changed, the look changed. Like hip hop was so dynamic for so long that there was no sense of history really until really it's only been what, 15 years or so that people have really gone back and acknowledged the golden age and then all the the underground stuff from the 90s. So I I don't, I, I could see why you didn't because people weren't thinking that way back then. I guess, but there's a lot of people that I know, a lot of my peers that did hold on to every flyer, every graphic, every poster, CDs, vinyl. A lot of people back then did. And I just, sadly, I didn't. And wow. anyway, but that's, yeah, but I, but I have great stories. A lot of them are still in my mind, like that cool key story. I have an amazing MF Doom live show story. I did one of his first live shows at SOBs during CMJ in 2000. I have unbelievable stories. And so even though I don't have footage from it necessarily, it's very clearly in my head. You know, I, I see it. I see that visually and I could play it back in my head. I just don't have visuals to show for it. But I'm going to crowdsource some of that stuff. When I'm writing a book, because at some point I'm, I am going to be working on a book, I am going to crowdsource and put it out on Facebook or put it out in a, in a chat somewhere, open it up to people to see if people did take video, did take pictures, were there photographers back then, were there videographers? Because I definitely remember that there were some in the room at SOBs, at downtime, downtown, the venue there, Mercury Lounge, Tramps, Knitting Factory. I definitely know that were people taking pictures and those were my shows. So I definitely have to do some research. I'm going to have to hire some people to do it for me. But I definitely know there's something out there. So it's a big work in progress. It's going to take a lot of time to compile everything. But it's definitely on my bucket list of what I need to accomplish in the next 10 years. Everyone keeps saying, when is the book coming? When is the book coming? It will be coming. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) We'll have you back. We'll have you back then. Yes. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Fiona Bloom and the Bloom Effect. Thank you, Aunt Taylor and the team at Light. Thank you, Craig Snyder and Michael Donaldson for rocking the post-production. And as always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On. Get and share all of our past episodes, write a review, even send us a message through our website, spotlightonpodcast.com. And if you like what we're up to here, please leave us a review on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Join us again in a few weeks for the start of Season 7. In the meantime, be safe and stay in touch.